Good morning, everyone. I'm Robert. This is Steve, Randall, and Nikki. And we are here live from the New York City AWS Summit. We're going to give you a recap of the keynote that just happened. Lots of really interesting announcements, incredible demos, customer testimonials. But let's begin. What, what stood out to you? What was the most amazing announcement today? Uh, my favorite part was the CDK. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but writing CloudFormation templates uh, in JSON is or YAML. It's YAML. not always the okay, most let's be fun real. It's always YAML. It's always YAML, never JSON. OK. Sometimes <laughs> it's JSON. But yeah, writing CDK, writing actual code now to write CloudFormation templates is probably the most exciting announcement for me. I'm going to say SageMaker Spot. Uh, that was really cool, too. Frankly, I've been using SageMaker for, you know, since it was announced. And now I, I don't pay my AWS bill because I work here. But uh, I'm sure my manager will be happy to see some of my SageMaker bills go down. Well, if they missed the, uh, if they missed this, the announcement, what actually was announced with SageMaker? Can you be more okay, specific? So we have a couple different modes of compute options that are available to you within AWS. You have you know, reserved instances, which are ones that you can pay for over a fixed period of time. And you can either pay an upfront cost or no upfront cost. You can have uh, on-demand instances. These are instances that you go and say, uh, I want these. I want n number of these at any point in time. But then we have something called the spot market. And the spot market lets you bid on the unused capacity of the cloud. Of other that, people's instances? or other? Not even other people's instances. It's just uh, instances that aren't currently in use. So the Available. spot price fluctuates. It's almost like a, a stock market. You know, it, it, The price fluctuates based on demand. So you can get up to a 90% discount on those instances. And now that you can pass those savings on to SageMaker, that's pretty darn cool. And there are a lot of really cool APIs around spot. There, there were companies like Team Internet that used to run their entire business on spot instances. And if the instance was terminated in less than one hour, you paid nothing. So they would purposely price their instances so that it would be terminated as soon as possible. Yeah. It was like the early version of Lambda. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and we've seen this play happen before, where uh, various compute resources will have these different tiers available. And spot is just a, your, an opportunity for you to say, you know, I'm going to set a base price beyond this. I have a flexible workload. Yep. And it's really cool to see that feature come into SageMaker. Uh, Steve, what was your favorite you announcement? Know, as an ex-dev, the CDK. But also, my old team, Visual Studio uh, ex Code Extension is now GA. That's just fantastic. Visual Studio Code is life. It's live. You two just stole my two favorite announcements. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be that one person. You know, Yeah, I'll order whatever she's ordering. <laughs> I feel so unoriginal. So I'm, I'm kind of Vim live and die. So it's, it's and die. rare to see me in, in an IDE. But I have to say Visual Studio Code is my favorite now. Uh -huh. uh, it has Vim mode. If Randall great. just said that, yes. it's real. It's, it's legit now. <laughs> Coming soon, Randall's going to start writing JavaScript. So Robert Tables, if you missed the VS Code announcement, um, our AWS toolkit for VS Code uh, went GA today. So it was actually in the extension store before today, but today it's generally available. If you go to your extension store in VS Code and you search AWS Toolkit, it will come up. You can install it. You can do all kinds of fun things with serverless applications now we, with the toolkit. We should also add that that toolkit is fully open sourced, right? It's been open sourced yes. from day one, right? We're yeah, getting feedback. Yeah, because you started building it. Isn't uh, that yeah, right, well, Steve? <laughs> a little bit. But yeah, Not it's been open sourced bit. from day one. You know, we're really interested in feedback. Where should we take this toolkit, right? Currently, it's targeted at serverless development. But what do you want it to do? What do you want it to go? I believe fact, CDK Steve is open source started. as well, right? CDK is also open source. Yes. There, we have a person on the stream watching today who is a contributor to CDK. Uh, and I think it was Iconics or something. Uh, you know, thanks for your contributions. It's pretty great to see mm -hmm. people in the community coming together to yes. make yes. CloudFormation <laughs> and CDK better. So we appreciate that. Shout out to contributors. <laughs> so why are we here? What are we doing? You, if you're just tuning in, we today had this big event in New York City where we talk about cloud, and we talk about all the fun things that are going on in the cloud. And we had our CTO, Werner Vogels, come on stage first. And he talked about uh, a large number of things. Uh, and then we had a couple of customers come on. One of those customers that was really, really cool to see was FINRA, the Financial Regulatory Authority. Yep. And I enjoyed learning and kind of diving deeper into the stuff that they do to prevent things like flash crashes. So I don't know if everyone remembers a couple years ago, they had this thing called a flash crash, where all these micro uh, or, or, or 
what are they called? High frequency trading algorithms where we're basically interrupting with each other and doing all these vast, super fast trades that crash the market very, very quickly for like an hour or, or not even an hour, like mi minutes. And the SEC realized they didn't have the, the capacity to monitor that sort of thing. So FINRA got tasked with building out a system that could go and investigate all of this and build it all, pull it all together. And the really fun, interesting fact about this is that it is serverless. So it is built on top of AWS Lambda. And I, I'm not sure how many people on the stream are familiar with AWS Lambda, but the way that it works is you just deal with your code. You're not dealing with any instances, you're not dealing with any servers or any operating system management, any security, anything like that. It's all just your code. And you only pay for what you use. And you only pay for what you use. You don't pay for idle. And they deal with billions of transactions per day in Lambda. That is a huge number. That's a huge workload to see going through. And it, it was very interesting to hear about that architecture. The video will be on YouTube later, and I'm sure they can describe it better than I can. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a great uh, opportunity to tie that back into Werner's point about the evolution of application development. Right? We had old school application development where it was monolithic. Uh, you did a lot of infrastructure engineering in addition to building your application. And then we saw the shift to move to microservices and containers. And the way Werner presents it, and it really resonated with me, is that he sees Lambda as the next step in that evolutionary process. Well, where, yeah. Where you are now, you have even higher signal to noise ratio if you consider application development, the signal, and undifferentiated heavy lifting, infrastructure management as the noise, right? So to kind of connect this with uh, another customer we saw on stage today, DoorDash, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, it really made me smile when I heard that. You know, they're, they're just focusing on building out application logic instead of sharding their database. Mm -hmm. And it's not, not just Lambda, but this, this entire shift toward serverless so that you can focus on the application, uh, the application logic, on the, on the application code, on the business. Yeah. I think this is the dream, even if it's something that you haven't articulated yet as a developer, this is what we all kind of subtly strive for. Yep. Yep. So going back to your point about microservices, I, I want to talk about DoorDash. I think DoorDash is very, very cool. And Andrew Fang, their CTO, was <laughs> on stage. And they gave a promo code. Uh, they did give a promo code. What was it? AWS NYC? Like, yep. Oh, yeah. We'll share that. Yes. Yeah. Can, can so we get that solid on the plug for later. DoorDash I'm going to put that in the chat. <laughs> yeah. um, when you think about microservices, right, think about the last 20 years of development. What's happened is you've taken these large monoliths, you've originally done splitting, by using something like SOAP, right? Or, or SOAP is like this XML protocol that you would have, and you would write Perl scripts, and they'd go in CGI bin, and there'd be chaos, and all kinds of other nonsense going on. But it gave you that ability to deliver things in an architected fashion. You didn't have to coordinate with one central controller to be able to make a single deploy, right? You could deploy your service item potently from, or independently from, or orthogonally from your you know, whole rest of your code base. This let engineering teams kind of explode outwards and do a lot more work. And then you see the next step of that evolution is splitting into REST or, or protocols like uh, uh, even GraphQL and things like that, or Protobuf or you know, some binary protocol. JSON is kind of the typical transfer medium at this point, I think. Yep. And what happens is you get all of these little containerized services. And like you said, a lot of those can become Lambda functions. And we had another customer on stage talking about how they use step functions to orchestrate. Step functions is a, a coordination layer for Amazon Lambda or AWS Lambda. It lets you take different Lambda functions and basically define a state machine that can do all kinds of parallel tasks or uh, even asynchronous invocations across different inputs and things like that. We had another customer come on and talk about that. And I, I think the fact that you are building all of this code in much, much smaller layers. Even with Lambda layers now, you can take some of the, the common logic out, ex extract it into a layer, and then include that in the functions that you need. If you're doing SAML auth or, or like... Create your own runtime. Create your own runtime, okay. too. That's a whole new API. I think a lot of that stuff is making serverless the paradigm of the future. And maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but... Well, that's exciting because that's my favorite thing. I feel <laughs> like we're going to like skip over containers a little bit. I, I don't know. I could be wrong. I've been wrong lots of times, but... Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So, so I'm I'm gonna I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll take that troll bait. Uh, I, I think there are lots of workloads that are well suited to containers. And yeah, I, think, I was gonna I, say long running processes. I, I think, I think yeah. we're gonna see them stick around for a while. And the thing I want to emphasize is, you know, as a company, we have this deeply ingrained philosophy of 
providing the right tool for the job. So we're really not doing this because we feel like this is the, this is the future per se. This is just what we get from customer feedback, right? We're constantly right. getting customer feedback that customers want to focus less on infrastructure, less on right. database sharding, and more on application logic. And as we examine those requirements, then these innovative solutions like, like AWS Lambda come out. Now, yeah. Also like App Mesh, they want visibility between microservices yes. with different types of compute. Yeah. I have a Lambda microservice, I also have a microservice running on a container. I need to be able to see what's happening between them and have them communicate. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's where I think I, I want to call out you know, this, this segment that Werner touched on, which is all of the solutions we have for containers. Uh, if you look at ECS, if you look mm -hmm. at EKS, Fargate, EC2, we have solutions across the stack for container application lifecycle management. Uh, and we had some exciting announcements that you alluded to just now, App Mesh with observability and, and routing. So uh, any, any highlights you want to call out there? On App Mesh? I mean, I think the important piece of App Mesh is exactly what I said, is that you can get visibility and, and connections across your microservices of different kinds of compute. So if you have you know, completely different compute uh, for your microservices, you have one microservice in a Lambda, one microservice in a container, or multiple in the, both kinds of compute, you can now have them talk to each other, see visibility across those different microservices um, without the worry of setting up connections between them. But that goes back to what Randall was saying earlier, though. You know, back in the day, we had so, and there was chaos. Yes. Right? Yes. There's messages flying everywhere, right? Now we have, okay, we have to somehow get a handle on this. It's like structure almost. Let's get some so structure like, on this, but still get it keep decomposed. Yeah. You know? Do you know, this is, this is not super important, but it's kind of weird. We built all these ORMs in the era of SOAP, right? And we built all of these, these transfer protocols and transfer management things. And now you don't need them anymore. Like, you don't mm -hmm. necessarily need an ORM anymore because you have, you're putting JSON directly into your database. You're getting JSON directly out. It's, a, it's an interesting concept. Like, we've almost leapfrogged that previous technology. And, of course, yeah. people still use ORMs. Spring is still, you know, around and very vibrant and doing good stuff. But um, one of the other things on the App Mesh side or not on the App Mesh side, but on the container side, was the launch of the CloudWatch Customer Insights. Uh, I think that was yesterday in oh, yeah. the, the container level moder monitoring with FluentBit and all of those other kind of things that can now be exposed as CloudWatch events. And CloudWatch got a couple of upgrades as well, anomaly detection, so you can take your existing metrics and it'll run an ML algorithm on them and it detect anomalies. Uh, with a nice little graph or yeah. chart, yeah. All in all, I feel like the observability component of things is getting better and better. There's still more work to be done. Uh, Less chaos, more well, structure, think, more insight. I think you need that, right? Because as developers move away from managing infrastructure and more are just, I'm looking at my code, right? That's all I want to look at. But I need to know what's going on. Yeah. I need that observability. You need right? to be able to see under the hood. I need to be able to see under the hood. In the old days, I would just go and look at my instance and see what's going on. In the new world, what are we going to call it, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm just looking at my code. So I need that insight. I need that observability. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about the first thing that Werner talked about, which was security. Mm -hmm. Yes. So security <laughs> is pretty much the first thing, or, or not pretty much, it is the first thing that we think about here at AWS. And there was a Reinforce conference that happened a couple weeks ago in Boston. And we talked a lot about some of the underlying security features that we've implemented over the years. And there's a great tweet thread by Colm about how we do some of that encryption. So we announced the fact that we do link layer encryption on a lot of things. And uh, we also have encryption in your VPCs. So your traffic over a VPC is encrypted. And what that means is even the, the virtualization packet header, even the, uh, the customer identifier header and things like that, those are all encrypted, which means we cannot do any sort of like analysis of your data. And that's how we want it. We, don't, we, don't, we want our customers to have trust in us. And to do that, we have to think about encryption and security as, as kind of paramount. And the, How about his shirt? Was it encrypt everything? Encrypt everything. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the other component of that, too, is you can't just use traditional algorithms. Like TLS is not enough, right? Uh, you can't just use, you know, what, what, what is the like common one, the elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography one from a, a couple years ago? Uh, you have to use like post quantum stuff. You have to use AES 256 and, and a couple other algorithms to bring everything into a way that you can change that encryption if it ever gets broken. You know, mm -hmm. and then uh, you have to formally verify 
all the various channels that you work on. So there's, we have this framework called S2N. It's on GitHub. It's an open source framework for encryption and for TLS. That framework is formally verified. So we have mathematical you know, investigations into whether or not this is possible to crack. And you know, there's a whole group of insanely smart people at AWS working on this. And I always find, like back when I was a customer of AWS, when I was able to grab time with those people, it really just gave me a lot more confidence in the platform. Uh, and I don't get to grab as much time with those people now that I work here, but I, I, I would love to see more of the kind of reinforced content like out there for people to consume. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Robert Tables with the timely Werner quote in Twitch chat, yeah. dance like no one's looking, encrypt like everyone is. I feel like that needs to be his next shirt. If he yeah. said it, yes. it needs, he, he just needs to put it on the he shirt. He says it. He needs to have a shirt with his face on it, <laughs> him saying it, you know, and it just goes on and on. He but, has that shirt already? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, but, uh, I've only seen the encrypt everything one. You know, that reminds <laughs> me, uh, and, and when you're talking about security and encryption, it's not just the data itself. It's also the path that it takes. And right. um, I'm going to jump around here a little bit, but when, uh, when Justin Fox from New Data was on the stage and he was presenting the, uh, the services that they use to automatically detect fraud, he was talking about the, the fact that the data needs to traverse in specific ways so as to meet the security requirements of their customers. And for that, he identified three ways that customers can connect to AWS via CloudFront, the Global Accelerator, and via Direct Connect. So I just want to call that out. It's like, you know, you were talking about encrypting of the data itself, but just as important is the ability to understand exactly where that data is going so that it is as much as possible transferring over secure channels and secure networks. And this is also consequently where our massive investments in the Amazon Global Network are, short, are is an example of how those investments have been paying off. And I know you 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 love I, talking I, about the Amazon Global Network, so now I'm going to hand it over to you. Just... Okay, so this is one of my favorite topics because I think it's one of the most interesting things that even as a, as a customer of AWS, I didn't really find out about until years later. And I, I understand we have a lot of new viewers coming in, so I want to say for those of you who may be just joining, this is the Amazon Web Services keynote recap. So we have a summit in New York that's happening today. We're recapping that summit. Uh, or we're recapping that keynote, and we're going to have other content throughout the day. Amazon Web Services is a global IT solutions provider that does uh, compute resources and various other services on demand with pay-as-you-go pricing and all that other good stuff. What I wanted to talk about with the global network is when you get back into security, there are things we do with lasers. So we have lasers on buildings. So when things are not in our own physical control, like when they're not or, or they're, they're things that we physically own and operate, but they're not always within our control, like say it's crossing a, a, a freeway or something, we have lasers that go along the line of sight that can detect interference. So that is the level of insanity, or sorry, security, I should say, <laughs> that, that is put into there. Freudian and slip. When you talk, talk about, um, what was it, Global Accelerator? Yep. It's hard for me to remember the non-codename version of these things. Uh, Global Accelerator, what it does is it publishes routes, BGP routes. B BGP is Border Gateway Protocol, and it's a, a protocol that frequently crashes the internet. Uh, but uh, what, it, what it is is it's a set of route tables that get propagated throughout uh, different ISPs, and it tells you where your traffic gets directed. So Global Accelerator will take a global IP and publish routes to that uh, across all of the various downstream links. So you can get onto the Amazon owned and operated network as quickly as possible with Global Accelerator. And CloudFront is the CDN. So we have more than 200 different uh, CDN points of presence now all across the world. And those, you can host your own content, and you can also run something called Lambda at Edge. So getting back to serverless, the really fun component of that is you can take uh, small functions and run them in CloudFront Pops, essentially. It's a very, very powerful concept, and there are entire applications that run only on Lambda at Edge. In addition to that, you have your own transatlantic cables and trans-Pacific cables, and we're investing in new ones all the time. Yeah. So these are things like the Hawaii Key cable that we invested in back in like 2016 and became operational in 2017. This is a cable that goes from California to Hawaii to New Zealand. And you know, there's, there's applied photonics that we have to look into. So yeah. when you talk about the networking stack, to enable a lot of the advances in networking, like 100 gigabit per second and beyond, you have to reinvent the core stack. Because using the two-inch metro fiber conduit for uh, you know, 3,000 fiber pairs or something, you, you, can, you can 
throw as much traffic as you want down that, but you still only have those 3,000 or so fiber pairs. So we took that two, same two-inch conduit, we worked with a bunch of vendors, and we worked with an applied photonics lab in a basement in Seattle somewhere, and we basically rebuilt that conduit to take 6,192 fiber pairs, which is absolutely insane. So the same two-inch conduit, more than double the capacity, and you can push so much networking down that. And it ends up, you know, you start getting into the point where you need like crazy fiber channel hardware to plug in and you have to build your own silicon. So what do we do? We build our own silicon. Yeah. And you just have to innovate at every level of the stack from hardware to software to uh, people and processes and operations in order to be able to operate at the scale. And it's very, very cool to see this deployed from the inside. Yeah, Meanwhile, definitely. Chad has a great service idea. Building lasers as a service. Lasers, lasers as a service. service. So We're while we're talking about global infrastructure, I should probably point out, I just saw a question in the chat about uh, AWS expansion into the Middle East. I think Werner started off by saying there are four new regions coming, each with three AZs. I think one of those is in the Middle East. I or couldn't hear Bahrain. you. Sorry, the crowd oh, is the super North, loud. Yeah, no, somebody just asked about re uh, regional expansion into the Middle East. And I think Werner started off by saying we've got four new regions coming online, so we're expanding yet again, each yeah. one with three AZs. Yeah, yeah. One of our I mods think, can post the uh, the infrastructure URL. We have that really cool uh, landing page. Epic Games is a is a customer of AWS, and they're uh, they're deployed globally on in all of our regions. And there are a lot of people who want uh, some other regions to come online so they can have faster Fortnite lag times. <laughs> um, talking about lag times, there's this cool concept of replica lag that uh, was it Andy Fang from the CTO of DoorDash brought up. I can't I can't remember who brought it up, but they use Aurora Postgres. And so they started out with Postgres on RDS. They moved into Aurora Postgres. And that allowed them to scale without having to shard. Sharding is this concept where your application becomes responsible, or maybe not your application, but PG Bounce or some other thing becomes responsible for directing your data around to different servers so that you can scale beyond the capacity of a single server. And with Aurora, you can scale the compute independently of the storage. So the storage layer is the shared layer and you just point new compute nodes at it. So they were able to scale to you know, multiple terabytes. That was DoorDash, by That the was way. DoorDash. Yeah, yeah. And you remember correctly. They also have read replicas for doing uh, ad hoc jobs and for serving content. And with MySQL Aurora, you can have multi-region read replicas, which is really cool. And you can also do logical replication in Postgres. Shameless plug for our databases show. So every Tuesday at noon, we have a show on databases here on this channel. If you wanted to learn more, we have a lot of episodes, good content. But I like the fact that we can guarantee like that three millisecond or lower replica lag in, uh, in, in, in an availability, or sorry, in a region, so that that's multiple availability zones. We can guarantee that three millisecond replication lag, which is pretty impressive if you know like these things are often separated by tens of miles. Yeah. And you have yeah. the laws of physics working against you. Definitely. And you, know, you can even do, with DynamoDB, you can do global tables now, which is a uh, single digit millisecond replica set lag across global deployments. Global tables. Robert Tables is drooling now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we, we can talk about databases all day. I, I don't want to take up all the time. There's some yeah. other great content well, that we well, can talk I, about. I did want to say one thing before we moved on from the, the Amazon Global Network on the topic of latency. You know, um, there's a really easy demo you can do yourself. Anybody in Twitch chat can do this if you want to get the full sense of, of uh, Global Accelerator. And uh, the way you do this is, um, if you've played any games, uh, you know that ping makes a lot of difference. And the ping between your client mm -hmm. and your server is determined by many factors, one of which is the number of hops it takes your packet to get from the client to the server. And in order to simulate this, you can just run a utility called Traceroute. Uh, and if you run Traceroute against the EC2 instance that is and is not behind Global Accelerator, you can see the difference. You can see your packet traversing across public internet infrastructure in exchange locations in order to get to that AWS data center versus finding the nearest direct connect location or the nearest Global Accelerator, basically the, the nearest edge location on the global network in order to travel across dedicated fiber. And once you're on dedicated fiber, that means lower packet loss, uh, lower variance in the latency, better gameplay experience. So if you don't, if you don't listen to the, the the features based on security, then I think if you're a gamer, you will definitely listen to the features based on ping. Yeah, and there's an interesting note there. So it is not guaranteed that using Global Accelerator will make it faster for all of your clients. And that is due to something called peering. 
So different ISPs have different peering agreements, and they only allow a certain amount of bandwidth over certain links. So not all ISPs play nice. There's this really great book called The Black Book of Internet Peering. You can look at it online. And it just contains all of the shady things that, that different people yeah. will do to, to get their you know, peered set up. But the other fun thing is uh, when, when you talk about like, the hops and when you talk about the, the kind of relevance to gaming customers, there's a huge set of games that dynamically scale into AWS. So uh, when Blizzard launched uh, Overwatch, that scaled dynamically into EC2 as they had to like, deal with more players than their capacity in their own data centers allowed. Mm -hmm. And so lots and lots of customers are doing this. And we recently launched something uh, on Amazon Gamelift, which is a, an engine for hosting these games, uh, which was like a battle royale mode, which supports uh, hundreds of players using the same server simultaneously. Mm -hmm. There's another really cool component about reliable data transfer. So you talked about once you're on this privately owned and operated network, you have reliable data transfer. There's this really cool protocol called, uh, I think it's, it's SRIOV, or that might be the driver that you use to get into this protocol. But it is essentially a reliable datagram protocol. So UDP, there, there are two different networking protocols that people typically send information over on the internet. You have TCP, and TCP and is like when you send your kid unaccompanied minor, you know, there's someone who picks them up, hands them to the, the airplane. They, there's someone who picks them up off the airplane and hands them to you. It's all like good and nice. And then there's UDP. And UDP is like taking your kid to JFK, giving them a $5 bill, and saying, go get to California. Good luck. <laughs> Best of luck. Actually, UDP is more like releasing your cat and then say, find your way to go across the country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the interesting component there is when you own and operate that network, you can have reliable UDP. Because UDP is one of these networks that you use a lot in gaming. People will send UDP messages, because it doesn't matter if you get every single one. And people will build these protocols around lossy stuff, lossy data. Whereas with reliable datagram protocols, you can start to rely on UDP being a protocol where you can just throw stuff across the wire as fast as possible, and you can get lots of good content. So there's this new thing called HP3. And Uber did a blog post about this recently, and it's built on top of UDP. And it's as UDP gets more reliable, uh, HP3 is going to adopt that as its transport medium. Mm. Interesting times we live in. Uh, okay, yeah, so, sorry, I got off track there. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I mean, that's. A, I feel that's like a we great... can make jokes about the two different network protocols like all day, though. <laughs> <laughs> like for real. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other thing I want to point out is it wasn't just VS Code that we have a toolkit for. We also have toolkits for IntelliJ. We have the Cloud9 editor. Uh, PyCharm. PyCharm. What is it? PyCharm. We have PyCharm. 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 Yeah, yeah. PyCharm. And of course, the toolkit for Visual Studio. Don't forget that. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, like that, that whole Jet, JetBrains suite, so IntelliJ, PyCharm, all of that, that all works. Um, when am I going to get my, my Luli CLI and Vim plugin? That's what I want to know. I just want to be able to have it as a, a Vim extension. You're going to get it when you write it. Yeah. Maybe that'll be go, my weekend project. Go build it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so who else did we hear from today? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the two customer use cases were both very interesting to listen to. Uh, I mean, especially Robert with... Robert Tables wants a Vim plugin. <laughs> yep. So which wants a Vim plugin? Robert Tables wants a Vim plugin. Oh, Vim of course plugin. he does, yes. <laughs> On the way. Robert course. Tables always... Course. Little always Bobby pushing. Tables. Randall will build it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So I've been volunteering drafted. So we also had um, New Data Security, which got... Uh, did they get acquired by, like, MasterCard or something? Uh, I can't remember. And they're a Canadian startup that started to tackle fraud. And they were the last customer to appear on stage today. And they talked about how they use machine learning to kind of identify fraud as it happens, as, so they can go out and find account takeovers and uh, phishing emails and things like that and kind of prevent those from happening. There's a lot of really cool tools to do that already within SageMaker, for instance. So there, there are algorithms that can go and and do that. And then there are uh, even algorithms in, in services like Kinesis. So Kinesis is a, a streaming service. You can have a couple different variants of it. You have Kinesis data streams, which is just JSON records or whatever you can throw across the wire. Firehose. You, you have Firehose, which lets you send the stuff to S3 or Splunk or Elasticsearch or maybe a couple other things. And S, I already said S3 bucket. Lambda. You have well, you can get a Lambda, Lambda take off the, yeah. And then you have Kinesis video streams, which can do 
uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of different video streams simultaneously, and you can perform inferences on those using recognition video. But within all of those, you have something called Kinesis Data Analytics. And this is the ability to run a jar or a custom SQL on your data as it's flowing through a Kinesis stream. And so there are lots of people who use anomaly detection and hotspot detection and things like that in Kinesis to just take their streaming data, whether it's a click stream or an email stream or, or whatever, and say, hey, this is an anomaly. I want to highlight that. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like Kinesis may not be the, the sexiest service in the world, so it doesn't get enough love. But I just want to give them a shout out. Like, it's a great service. I use I it all the time. Kinesis. So, love uh, Kinesis. I love and, Kinesis. And you saw it in a couple of the architecture diagrams today on stage. And it, it really is kind of a, a big backbone for a lot of streaming data services. And of course, yeah. we have managed Kafka now as well. Uh, but I, I'm going to stick with Kinesis, I think. Right I'm tool definitely for the partial job. to Kinesis on well, that one. All right, Twitch, this is all the time we have for now. Uh, we could be here talking all day, and we will. We're going to we'll take. Be we'll be right we're going to bring you literally. lots more content throughout mm -hmm. the rest of the day, so stay tuned. We're going to dive into detail. We're going to have expert guests on the stage with us to talk through various launches, features, demos. It's going to be a great time, so please stick around.